Good morning. Welcome to Teddy Talks for Saturday, May 9th, 2020. I'm Joe Wiegand coming to you from Medora, North Dakota, in the beautiful Badlands. It's a beautiful day in the Badlands of North Dakota. And by beautiful, I mean beautiful uh, with regards to a, a gray, cold, and blustery day uh, where the, uh, the grounds are still wet from a good night's rain. Now that means the trails up above uh, will be gumbo. Uh, uh, the clay here gets stuck to your boots. Uh, I'm remembering on this Mother's Day weekend, uh, my late mother, Joan Elizabeth Prager Wiegand, wonderful artist, uh, student, great mother, who uh, found from her three little boys in Elmhurst, Illinois, along Salt Creek and nearby the Forest Preserve, that inclement weather was no excuse for staying indoors. So out we would go into the weather and, and mom might have just a little bit of quiet time and a cup of coffee and, and a phone chat with a, a family friend. Happy Mother's Day weekend to everyone. Uh, there will be no program tomorrow on Mother's Day. Uh, instead tonight at Teddy Roosevelt's show, I'll post a little something about Theodore Roosevelt's mother, Martha Mitty Bullock Roosevelt, the Rose of Roswell, Georgia, and perhaps a few of the other mothers in Theodore Roosevelt's life. We've got a wonderful week of programs ahead. Uh, on uh, Monday, we'll be uh, in California still with President Roosevelt, uh, but also, uh, that's from uh, May 11th of 1903, we'll also uh, read uh, uh, his column, Murder on the High Seas, May 11th, 1915, in the Metropolitan Magazine. Uh, we operate so quickly now, 24-hour news, immediate commentary, but Imagine, I mentioned he's a, a defendant in the Barnes v. Roosevelt trial, moved from Albany to Syracuse. And in the midst of that, he uh, gets an, a magazine article done responding to the German atrocity, remember, that was late on the evening of the 7th. Tuesday, the 12th of May, California again and Leland Stanford Junior University, named for the deceased son of California Governor Leland Stanford Sr. And... Uh, We'll have Theodore Roosevelt's remarks to the graduates there in 1903. And then this was wonderful. Uh, I do believe uh, the date was 1911. Teach the trades. Spoken to the students at DeWitt Clinton High School, a name for the uh, governor of New York. And it's been my pleasure to come to life as Theodore Roosevelt for the students at DeWitt Clinton High School. May 13th, Wednesday, San Francisco in 1903 for the president and his opening remarks in uh, May of 1908 at the White House to the Conference on the Conservation of Natural Resources. But we know this as the White House Conference or the Governor's Conference of 46 governors, uh, territories represented. Nearly every governor or some high level representative of the governor attending that conference chaired by Gifford Pinchot, Theodore Roosevelt's forester and future two term governor of Pennsylvania. Many of these state conservation agencies have their origin uh, from the conference uh, at the White House. Thursday, May 14th, uh, 1903, back to California, San Francisco and Oakland. And uh, as well then, we'll be looking uh, on the days following to introduce you, though uh, perhaps there's not a great deal written. I'll get into the materials uh, uh, tomorrow and see what we can dig out of Theodore Roosevelt's time with John Muir at Yosemite. We know the impact, very often we say that that uh, camping experience impacted the future of American public policy with regards to national parks, uh, certainly with regards to the preservation of Yosemite, the taking back of some of uh, what had been the Yosemite grant under the leadership of the, uh, or mismanagement of the California Parks Commission, if you ask John Muir, uh, putting it back into the National Reserve. May 15th, uh, 1900, Buffalo and Oyster Bay, New York. So some messages from Governor Roosevelt, perhaps with his eye on uh, uh, the uh, convention to follow uh, uh, for the nomination for president and vice president for the Republican Party. And 1908, uh, uh, DR returns a couple of days later and has his remarks to the closing of the conservation conference held at the White House in 1908. May 16th, next Saturday, a week from today, I thought this might be interesting. In 1900, as governor, a speech to the Hungarian Republican Club in New York City. In 1906, at the White House, uh, uh, remarks to the Missouri Synod of the German Lutheran Church. 
and in 1908 uh, remarks at the White House again to the General Conference of the Methodist Episcopal Church. So uh, when I mention it's a beautiful day in the Badlands and Medora, that's in part as well to the fact that today Theodore Roosevelt National Park is again opening to the public. You're welcome to come and uh, visit uh, the south and north units of Theodore Roosevelt National Park. In between, uh, go north from exit 10 at Sentinel Butte, and you can see uh, you can see the Elkhorn Ranch site, a lovely place to walk, and it's grass path, uh, not likely to be gumbo like our buttes here in town. This day in history, May 9th, 1657, the death of William Bradford, an English-American politician, the second governor of Plymouth Colony, born in 1590. Uh, he was a signatory to the Mayflower Compact. We would consider that, I think, to be amongst our founding documents. Theodore Roosevelt would have certainly been familiar with its contents and the, the landing and establishment of what eventually would uh, go from Plymouth Colony to Massachusetts Bay Colony and, uh, and eventually to the state of Massachusetts, where he uh, went to college and, and married a, a daughter of a, a Boston family. This is, in November, the 400th anniversary of the signing of the Mayflower Compact, famous painting done uh, in later uh, years, or so, a couple of centuries hence, of the, uh, the representatives, all men, signing that uh, compact. It's from William Bradford that we uh, receive the words in one version. The original document has been lost to history, but uh, some of those original handwritten copies that some of the signatories made still exist. It's brief, and I think uh, as a bit of a background to how and whence we were founded, recall the pilgrims, as we call them, that come from England, uh, had also spent some time in the Netherlands. They were uh, uh, had their own branch of uh, Protestantism. And uh, so they were looking for religious liberty, the freedom to worship God as they chose. So here's uh, briefly the words from the uh, Mayflower Compact. In the name of God, amen. We whose names are underwritten, the loyal subjects of our dread sovereign, Lord King James, by the grace of God of Great Britain, France, and Ireland, King Defender of the Faith, having undertaken for the glory of God and advancement of the Christian faith and the honor of our king and country, a voyage to plant the first colony in the northern parts of Virginia, do by these presents, solemnly and mutually, in the presence of God and one another, covenant and combine ourselves together into a civil body politic for our better ordering and preservation and furtherance uh, of the ends aforesaid, and by virtue hereof, do enact, constitute, and frame such just and equal laws, ordinances, acts, constitutions, and officers from time to time as shall be thought most meet and convenient for the general good of the colony, unto which we promise all due submission and obedience, in witness whereof we have hereunto subscribed our names at Cape Cod, the 11th of November, in the reign of our sovereign Lord King James of England, France, and Ireland, the 18th, and of Scotland, the 54th, Anno Domini, 1620. May 9th, 1791, uh, the death of Francis Hopkinson, an American judge and politician, a signer of the Declaration of Independence on behalf of New Jersey. Uh, I uh, do not know all the names by heart of the men who signed the Declaration of Independence, and perhaps I should. May 9th, 1800, the birth in Torrington, Connecticut of John Brown, American abolitionist, bleeding Kansas, and the raid on Harper's Ferry, uh, Virginia at the time, not yet West Virginia, in 1858 uh, or 59. His death by execution, by hanging, was 1859. For that raid, uh, which, of course, killed uh, people on both sides, John Brown attempting to seize the federal armory at, uh, at Harper's Ferry and arm an uprising of slaves in, in that region of Virginia. A TR's new nationalism speech, Theodore Roosevelt's new nationalism speech, uh, given in Osawatomie, Kansas, was at the dedication of the John Brown historic site, uh, the state historic site in Osawatomie, Kansas. 
that new nationalism speech, though given September 1st, 1910, really became the basis for the Progressive Party platform adopted in 1912. Uh, the central issue in that speech, he argued, was government protection of human welfare and property rights, but also asserted that human welfare was more important than property rights. President Barack Obama would return to Osawatomi on September 1st, 2010, the centennial of uh, uh, Theodore Roosevelt's new nationalism speech. And I've had the pleasure again of being uh, at the wonderfully kept uh, and uh, beautifully interpreted John Brown State Historic Site in Osawatomie, Kansas. That's south of Kansas City, uh, for those of you looking for a, a good summer trip in the Midwest. May 9th, 1887, Buffalo Bill Cody's Wild West. Now, uh, I'm told the word show wasn't in the uh, title originally, and, and indeed, when he uh, developed the show, it would go to be Buffalo Bill Cody's Wild West and International Congress of Rough Riders. Uh, so the, the term Rough Riders was being used by uh, Bill Cody before Theodore Roosevelt and the press uh, 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 attached it to his name with his regiment in 1898. So Buffalo Bill Cody took his show, which had been touring for about four years. I think he established that show out of Kansas and Nebraska in about uh, 1883, the same year that Theodore Roosevelt and the Marquis came here uh, to the Badlands. That show, which played in London uh, for Queen Victoria's Golden Jubilee, the 50th anniversary of her, of her reign, it, it ran, uh, had more than 300 performances closed in October of 87, more than 2.5 million tickets sold for that show. It was a big hit, that cowboy show. And that International Congress showed uh, riders, uh, uh, gauchos, uh, Arabians, uh, uh, people from throughout the world uh, uh, that uh, were horsemen. In May 9th of 1873, the birth in Kladno, Bohemia, Austria-Hungary of Anton Cermak, the Czech-American captain and politician, the 44th mayor of Chicago, elected in 1931, defeated the last Republican in Chicago, a uh, uh, big Bill Thompson. Uh, there's uh, some wonderful uh, uh, analysis of the ethnic politics of Chicago at the time. Being Czech, it was said that uh, uh, Cermak could get votes that candidates of other ethnicities couldn't. Uh, while shaking hands with President-elect Franklin D. Roosevelt at Bayfront Park in Miami, Florida, on this date in uh, 1933, remember the inauguration would not occur in I think that's an erroneous uh, statement. I, I think certainly the inauguration would have occurred in March. So on May 9th, uh, 1933, with President uh, Franklin D. Roosevelt, Cermak was shot in the lung and mortally wounded by Giuseppe Zangara, who uh, it's thought was attempting to assassinate Roosevelt. Said so, there's some analysis that thinks that instead Capone had put a hit on Cermak. Uh, in any case, uh, whether it's legend or whether it's true, it's said that uh, Cermak's last seven words, still remembered now at Bayfront Park in Miami, were to FDR when he said, I'm glad it was me, not you. Uh, well, May 9th, 1899, uh, Theodore Roosevelt spoke to the uh, City Club of New York as uh, governor of New York. And that's a speech that I'm not going to give you uh, on this day as we're going to stick with the idea of a, a couple of speeches from California and Colorado, but also one other point in uh, history. On this date in 1914, the death by suicide in Santa Barbara, California of C.W. Post, the founder of uh, Post Foods, Postum uh, was uh, the name for the, uh, the cereal uh, that uh, made a fortune. Uh, the family had uh, uh, oh, camps and houses all throughout uh, originally from Springfield, Illinois, and and then going out to Santa Barbara, but also a, a great estate in Long Island and very nearby to Theodore Roosevelt's Sagamore Hill, so that the great estate of C.W. Post is now Long Island University Post and uh, the uh, Theodore Roosevelt Institute, headed by Tweed Roosevelt, uh, former president of the Theodore Roosevelt Association and great-grandson of Theodore Roosevelt via Archie's uh, line, uh, that uh, that institute is headquartered at CW Post and certain to continue to host some wonderful seminars about Theodore Roosevelt. Uh, of interest uh, to modern audiences, perhaps the fact that uh, the, uh, CW Post 
his daughter, Marjorie Merriweather Post, would later marry financier E.F. Hutton, and it's there that they owned the 177-acre estate on Long Island's North Shore called Hillwood, sold the estate to Long Island University. Well, of course, uh, Marjorie Merriweather Post Hutton, uh, she had the estate in uh, Palm Beach, Florida, Mar-a-Lago, uh, now uh, the president, uh, President Trump's uh, uh, retreat in Florida. So I just find some of that uh, wonderfully uh, interesting. I hope you do too. Thanks for being with us here at Teddy Talks. We had 26th days with the 26th president in the month of April. We've got 26 days with the 26th president here in the month of May. Things are starting to pick up and get busy. As I mentioned, the uh, National Park is open today. If you're going to uh, plan a visit, please do visit the website for Theodore Roosevelt National Park. They have some very practical advice about uh, bringing out some of your own materials, especially uh, cleaning and hygiene materials and plenty of water. Uh, it won't be one of those 90 uh, uh, degree days here on which we always say take a lot of water out into the uh, park, but uh, do uh, do plan your trip accordingly. How about uh, uh, quickly uh, from May 9th, 1903, a speech to the forest rangers in Santa Barbara, California. Let me say a word of thanks to the members of the forestry force who acted as my escort. I wish to thank the other gentlemen also, but particularly the members of the forestry force. I am, as you gentlemen probably know, exceedingly interested in the question of forestry preservation. I think our people are growing more and more to understand that in reference to the forests and the wild creatures of the wilderness, our aim should be not to destroy them simply for the selfish pleasure of one generation, but to keep them for our children and our children's children I wish you, the forest rangers, and also all the others, to protect the game and wild creatures, and of course in California, where the water supply is a matter of such a vital moment, the preservation of the forest for the merely utilitarian side is of the utmost, of the highest possible consequence, and there are no members of our body politic who are doing better work than those who are engaged in the preservation of the forest, the keeping of nature as it is, for the sake of its use and for the sake of its beauty. And then in San Luis Obispo, California, uh, they uh, remember that now, the train station and the depot in San Luis Obispo. Uh, the uh, city mothers and fathers had advanced the idea in recent years of having a uh, wonderfully sort of modernist uh, interpretation of Theodore Roosevelt, a new statue made to commemorate this speech and this visit and, and uh, uh, it's been reconsidered. It, uh, it's been deemed perhaps uh, inappropriate to have another statue to a dead white man in San Luis Obispo, California. I lament that uh, boys and girls might uh, miss an opportunity to learn about a, a great American president for that, uh, that decision. Perhaps it will be reviewed. Mr. Chairman and you, my fellow citizens, it is indeed a great pleasure to have the chance of meeting you this afternoon. For three days now, I have been traveling through your wonderful and beautiful state, and I marvel at its fertility. I am not surprised to see you looking happy. I should be ashamed of you if you did not. I know of this country in connection with certain Eastern agricultural producers, for unless I mistake, those who offered prizes for the largest vegetables and fruits of certain kinds have had to bar the products from this county because they invariably won the prizes. I know of one Eastern producer who said that the products of this county would have to be barred because he had spent already $500 in prizes to the county and had gotten back but $14 for seeds. I have forgotten all of the records that you have in the county. I know that the largest pumpkin watermelon, and onion came from here, so that your agricultural products have made a name for themselves to be feared. Of course, in stock raising and dairying, the county stands equally prominent. I am glad to learn that the state of California is erecting here the Polytechnic Institute for giving all the scientific training in the arts of farm life. More and more our people have waked to the fact that farming is not only a practical but a scientific pursuit, 
and that there should be the same chance for the tiller of the soil to make his a learned profession that there is in any other business. For three days, I have been traveling through one of those regions of our country where the interests are agricultural and pastoral, where the tiller of the soil, the man who grows stock, who is engaged in agriculture, is the man whose interest is predominant. And of course, it is the merest truism to say that it is the earth tiller, the soil tiller, the man of the farms, the man of the ranches, who stands as the one citizen indispensable to the entire community. The welfare of the nation depends even more than upon the welfare of the wage worker, upon the welfare of the homemaker of the country regions. I congratulate you people of California upon the evidence that you have grasped, the fact which our people must grasp, that the legislation of the country must be shaped in the direction of promoting the interests of the man who has come on the soil to stay and to rear his children to take his place after him. We have passed the stage as a nation when we can afford to tolerate the man whose aim it is merely to skin the soil and go on, to skin the country, to take off the timber, to exhaust it and go on. Our aim must be by laws promotive of irrigation, by laws securing the wise use and perpetuity of the forest, by laws shaped in every way to promote the permanent interests of the country. Our aim must be to hand over to our children not an impoverished, but an improved heritage. That is the part of wisdom for our people. We wish to hand over our country to our children in better shape, not in worse shape, than we ourselves got it. I have congratulated you upon your material well-being and upon the steps that you are taking still further to increase that material well-being. I wish further to congratulate you upon what counts even more than material prosperity upon taking care of the interests that go to make up the higher life of the nation. I am greeted here by men who wear the button that shows that they proved true to a lofty ideal when Abraham Lincoln called to arms in the hour of the nation's agony. Our nation showed itself great in those days because the nation's sons in 61 in the years immediately following had in them to care for something more even than material well-being because they had in them to feel the lift toward lofty things which only generous souls can feel. I see around me the men who took part in the great civil war, whose presence should excuse me from preaching, for their practice preaches louder than any words of mine could. I have seen everywhere through your state, in addition, the care you are taking in educating the children. I have been struck by the schools, and as I have said, a special word of greeting to the men who deserve so well of the nation, so I wish to say a special greeting to the future, to the children, to those who are to be the men and women of the next generation, and upon whom it will depend whether this country goes forward or not. It is a good thing to raise such products as you have raised on your farms. It is a better thing to bring up such children as I think I have been seeing today. I like the way in which, through your schools, you are training the children to citizenship in the future. Ultimately, though soil and climate will count for much, what will count for most is the average character in the individual citizen, the individual man or woman. That is what counts in the long run in making a nation. I go from you with an e even increased faith in the future of our country, the future of America, because I go with an even increased faith and confidence in what the average American citizen is and will be. I believe in you, men and women of California, men and women of America, of the United States, because I feel that you are not only sound in body and sound in mind, but that which counts for more than body, more than mind, character, into which many different elements enter, but above all, the elements of decency, of courage, and of common sense. Well, that's Theodore Roosevelt in California, just before he disappears into Yosemite with John Muir. And uh, if I may, I would like to just go briefly, rather than a, a long speech to the Chamber of Commerce, I, I had meant to, uh, uh, to mention that... Uh, there are editorial decisions uh, to be made. Uh, were I to do every speech that Theodore Roosevelt uh, might have made on May 9th through history, uh, 
it might be much too long a program. So while I choose to read the speeches in their entirety, not uh, uh, excerpting anything for the sake of repetition or, or because I'm uh, embarrassed or I think we might not be able to uh, understand or comprehend uh, Theodore, Theodore Roosevelt in his time with regards to maybe some comments that might seem to be insensitive or incorrect in today's environment, I'll want to make the speeches in whole. Uh, but in making that decision of which speeches to make, well, then I've got some decisions to make. Usually I'll try to make them based on uh, a rubric of wondering what you might be interested in. So I'm going to take some time on Sunday to catch up on some correspondence. If between now and Monday you have any questions or comments, or if you'd like to correspond in the manner that we've established here at uh, Facebook, or uh, if there's an opportunity uh, for you to listen at Spotify or YouTube and come around to make a comment, uh, uh, you'll be able to find me just about anywhere and send me a note. But uh, Joe W at Medora.com and that uh, suffix Medora.com. Go there to start planning your summer visit to Medora. I am now going to do the uh, the speech to the Chamber of Commerce and Board of Trade in Denver, Colorado. And uh, we'll wrap up our visit today with this. And I'll hope to see you here on Monday, May 9th, 1905. And again, this is after uh, coming out of a, a three-week uh, trip uh, up into the mountains uh, of Colorado, hunting with Johnny Goff. Mr. President, Mr. Toastmaster, and you, men of Denver, men of Colorado, I hope I need not say how glad I am to be your guest tonight. Let me just say one word in reference to the work of this organization, of which I am not only the guest, but to which I owe my most sincere thanks for having elected me to honorary membership. You have done a great work for the material prosperity of this city, of this state. I fully appreciate, as every sensible man must, the great, the vital importance of that work. We must have a basis of material prosperity before any community, whether state, municipality, or nation can develop itself, can rise in any degree. There must in the community, as in the individual, be first as a basis the material prosperity. But woe to the community, woe to the individual, that accepts such material prosperity as the be-all and the end-all of its life. In the world at large, and especially in this nation, we have been passing through an era of materialism. It has had its good side, and it has had its poor side. And we of this country will never rise level to the standard that should be set here until we not only understand but apply the truth that material prosperity is only the foundation and that its worth depends entirely upon the kind of moral superstructure of good citizenship that we build upon it. No wealth, no material well-being shall avail the nation where class hatreds flourish, where man looks upon his brother with envy and hatred or with arrogance and contempt according to his position, where the average man fails to understand that the supreme good for any man is the granting him the opportunity and training him to the power to do service to the community at large. I believe in material well-being, of course. I should be a fool if I did not. I believe in material well-being. I believe in those who have built it up. But I believe also that it is a curse if it is not accompanied by the lift toward higher things. We of this country, we who have enjoyed the marvelous prosperity that this country has possessed, in a degree preeminent above all other nations of earth, must in the future show our understanding of this doctrine, or we shall fail to make of the Republic what it must and shall be made, an example for all the nations of mankind. But do not think that I fail to understand the importance of our material well-being. I congratulate Denver with all my heart that it is the center of the great mining and livestock industries, it is of enormous consequence to all our people that any section of this country should do well. Do not forget that. So far from its being a hurt to any one section to see another section prosper, we can, on the contrary, count it as certain that if a part of this country prospers, much the rest of the country will, as a whole, feel some good effects from the result of the prosperity. As Senator Patterson was just saying to me, when three years ago we succeeded in getting through that law, which I am so very proud, should have been enacted during my administration, 
the law by which the nation undertook to do its share in the great work of reclamation of the arid lands of the West. When we got through that law, there were certain short-sighted people, representing as they believe the interests of the non-arid Eastern lands, who objected to its passage on the ground that it would help build up their rivals, whereas they ought to have seen that whatever built up the intermountain states would add to the prosperity of all the United States. There is just one safe motto for Americans to act on, that is, the motto of all men up, not some men down. In a very small way, I am trying to build up another industry for the benefit of the whole country, which we are starting here in Colorado. Through Secretary Wilson of the Department of Agriculture, in connection with your agricultural college, we are starting the development of a breed of American horse, which may be called the general utility horse. If I have any influence with this administration, I'm going to have this work continued. Also, incidentally, if any of you have come from Vermont, you will appreciate this. I think that for this end, we should develop the old breed of Morgan horse, because we have in the Morgan horse a, a type which is not surpassed in any country for the purpose to be served by the breed of horse most important for us to develop. I do not think that the perpetuation of that fine old stock should be left to private breeders. I think the government should take part in it. The reason we have started this horse breeding by the government here in Colorado is that we find, for reasons that I am not wholly able to explain, that the stoutest forelegs in horses are developed here in Colorado. And so I hope the senators from Colorado will help me to develop the Morgan horse in Colorado. Gentlemen, I want to say a word as to a governmental policy in which I feel that this whole country ought to take a great interest, and which is itself but part of a general policy into which I think our government must go. I speak of the policy of extending the powers of the Interstate Commerce Commission, of giving them the power to fix rates, and to have the rates that they fix go into effect practically at once. As I say, that represents in my mind of what should be the general policy of this country, the policy of giving not to the state, but to the national government, an increased supervisory and regulatory power over corporations. The first step, and to my mind, the most important step in this general policy, is to give the nation, in effective form, this power over the great transportation corporations of this country. In the days of the fathers of the older among you, the highways of commerce for civilized nations were what they had always been, waterways and roads. Therefore, they were open to all who chose to travel upon them. Within the last two generations, we have seen a system grow up under which the old methods were completely revolutionized, and now the typical highway of commerce is the railroad. Compared to the railroad, the ordinary road for wheeled vehicles and the waterway were, whether natural or artificial, have lost their importance. Here in Colorado, for instance, it is the railroads which, of course, are the only highways that you need to take into account in dealing with the question of commerce in the state or outside of the state. Therefore, under this change system, we see highways of commerce grow up, each of which is controlled by a single corporation or individual, sometimes several of them being controlled in combination by corporations or a few individuals. When such is the case, in my judgment, it is absolutely necessary that the nation, for the separate states cannot possibly do it, should assume a supervisory and regulatory function over the great corporations which practically control the highways of commerce. Now fix clearly in your minds two facts at the outset. As with everything else mundane, when you get that supervisory and regulatory power on behalf of the nation, you will not have cured all the evils that existed and you will not equal the expectations of the amiable but ill-regulated enthusiast who thinks that you ought to have cured all those evils. A measure of good will come. Some good will be done. Some injustice will have been prevented. But we shall be a long way from the millennium. Get that fact clear in your mind, or you will be laying up for yourselves a store of incalculable disappointment in the future. That is the first thing. Now, the second and even more important matter. When you give the nation that power, remember that harm and not good will come unless you give it with the firm determination not only to get justice for yourselves, but to do justice to others. You must be as jealous to do justice to the railroads as to exact justice from them. 
We cannot afford in any shape or way in this country to encourage a feeling which would do injustice to a man of property, any more than to submit to injustice from a man of property. Whether the man owns the biggest railroad or the greatest outside corporation in the land, or whether he makes each day's bread by the sweat of that day's toil, he is entitled to justice and fair dealing, to no more and to no less. A spirit of envy on the part of those less well-off against the better off is as bad as and no worse than a spirit, a spirit of arrogant disregard for the rights of the man of small means on the part of the man of large means. The arrogance and envy are not two different qualities. They are the same quality shown by men under different circumstances. We must make up our minds that nothing but harm will come from any scheme to exercise such supervision as that I advocate over corporations and especially over the common carriers, unless we have it clearly fixed in our minds that the scheme is to be one of substantial justice, alike to the common carrier and to the public. If I have the appointment or retention of any commission in power to administer a law of such increased powers, I shall neither appoint nor retain the man who would fail to do justice to the railroads any more than I would appoint or retain the man who would fail to exact justice from the railroads. I want that understood as a preliminary. If I have the appointment of any of those men or their retention, they will give a square deal all around, or else their shrift will be short. But with that statement as a preliminary, I wish to urge with all the earnestness I possess, not only upon the public, but upon those interested in the great railway corporations, the absolute need of acquiescence in the enactment of such law, as has been well set forth by the Attorney General, Mr. Moody, in his recent masterly argument presented to the committee of the Senate, which is investigating the matter. The legislators have the right, and as I believe, the duty to confer these powers upon some executive body. It cannot confer them upon any court, nor can it take away the court's power to interfere if the law is administered in a way that amounts to confiscation of property. Of course, it would be possible to come much short of such confiscation and yet do great damage, perhaps irreparable damage, uh, to the great corporations engaged in interstate commerce. We must remember always that most of the men who are responsible for the management of these great corporations and who have profited thereby have made their fortunes not as incidental to damaging, but to benefiting the community as a whole. We must be careful that nothing is done that would jeopardize their industries and that would therefore work harm of the most far-reaching kind, not only to all, from the humblest to the highest, engaged in these industries, but to the business community as a whole. We must be careful to see that the law is administered with sanity and conservatism. But the power must exist if justice is to be done, as between the public and the common carrier, and some governmental executive tribunal, not only to fix rates and alter them when convinced that existing rates do injustice, but to see that the rate thus fixed goes into effect practically at once. I do not ascribe it to any moral culpability of the men engaged in handling these great corporations that they cannot see some of the bad effects of certain things they do. It is most natural for a man who is trying to carry on his business in competition with some other business to think that whatever he does that would beat his competitor is a pretty good thing for the community at large. And often I do not blame him for what he does, but I intend to prevent his doing it when it is against the public wheel. I cannot attempt to speak in detail of all that should be put into the law as I hope it will be enacted at the next session of the National Congress. Not only should this power over rates go in, but in my belief, we should at the same time deal with the private car question, which as regards certain industries, offers an even greater menace than is offered by the present system of fixing rates. I do not think that the law will have to deal with many subjects, but I do feel that with the two I have mentioned, and with perhaps one or two others, it should deal effectively. There will be the argument made on the other side, and doubtless the argument being made in their own minds by certain of my hearers, that such power is liable to abuse. Of course it is. The power of taxation is liable to grave abuse, and yet it must exist in the appropriate legislative body. You cannot give any needed power to the representatives of, of the people without exposing yourselves to the danger of that power being abused. There must be the possibility of abuse, or there cannot be the possibility of effective use. 
In closing, I wish to mention one governmental project which I have been instrumental, I think, in having started, which will have a certain bearing upon this question, and that is the Panama Canal. It is perhaps unnecessary for me to say that I am perfectly aware that many most admirable gentlemen disagreed with me in my action toward the Panama Canal, but I am in a wholly unrepentant frame of mind in reference thereto. The ethical conception upon which I acted was that I did not intend that Uncle Sam should be held up while he was doing a great work for himself and all mankind. But without regard to that, when the canal comes into operation, I think it will have a very important regulatory effect in connection with the transcontinental commerce of the great railroads. I think when such is the case, those great railroads will have to revise their way of looking at the interests of certain inland cities. Let me repeat, I have told you my views as to what I regard to be the most important matter of internal national legislation that in the immediate future will be before this people. I wish to say again that important though that legislation is, it is nothing like as important as the spirit in which we approach it. If we approach it in the spirit of demagogy, if we permit ourselves as a people to be deluded into the belief that permanent good will come to us as a mass, if we attack unjustly the property rights of others because they are wealthy, but we shall do ourselves just as much damage as if we permitted an attack upon those who are poor because they are poor. In time past, republic after republic has existed in this world and has gone down to destruction, sometimes because the republic was turned into a government of the poor who plundered the rich, sometimes because it was turned into a government of the rich who exploited the poor. It made no difference whatever to the fate of the republic which form its fall took. That fall was just as certain in one case as in the other. It was just as certain to follow the triumph of a class which plundered another class, whether the class thus given mastery was the class of the poor who plundered the rich or the class of the rich who exploited the poor. The destruction was as inevitable in one instance as in the other. We have the right to look forward with confident hope to the future of this republic because it will not and shall not become the republic of any class, either poor or rich, because it will and shall remain as its founders intended it to be, and as its rescuers under Abraham Lincoln intended it to be, a government where every man, rich or poor, so long as he does his duty to his neighbor, is given his full rights, is guaranteed justice, and has justice exacted from him in return. My goodness, my friend Daniel and I are headed up to Williston, North Dakota to see our wonderful friend Joyce. And up there, we're going to be just on the uh, side of the uh, Great Northern Railroad. And of course, that was subject to uh, uh, the uh, Northern Securities uh, Trust and the antitrust case initiated in 1902, I believe decided in 1904 by the Supreme Court, a 5-4 decision in the government's favor uh, the uh, regulation of the railroads uh, would continue. The Hepburn Act uh, eventually would give the Interstate Commerce Commission the, the powers alluded to by the president here, all subject to judicial review uh, by the uh, federal courts. And I think having uh, original jurisdiction because of this uh, incidence of interstate commerce. It's a beautiful day. Happy Mother's Day, one and all. God bless the mothers. I think you hear from Theodore Roosevelt, and I hope you know from my heart there's nothing more important in this country than our mothers. God bless uh, each and everything you do for our families and for our communities and for this country. God bless our doctors and nurses, many of whom are mothers. We'll see you on Monday. Goodbye. Good luck.